Hi everyone, welcome to day three of the Metabolome Informatics Workshop. Uh, we've spent the first day talking about uh, translating raw mass spectrometry data into input files, essentially. We're, we spent the second day talking about differentiation uh, and recognizing which things are features across multiple files, uh, multiple experiments. Uh, today we're going to talk about a really important problem and I fear that a lot of what I have to say about identification in metabolites is going to be empty. Uh, it's going to be uh, less satisfactory than we would like and we'll have fewer workflows to show you that everyone can work with. But my, my hope is that we can at least talk about the principles that we use for identification and uh, examine a couple of the major web, web databases for that purpose. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and plow right in. Uh, we'll start uh, with our discussion of online databases for this purpose. We're going to be talking about Metlin and MassBank. Now, Metlin is created by Gary Susiak's group at Scripps Research Institute. Um, I spent a lot of time near Gary, and I didn't realize uh, just how amazing his work actually was. Uh, my lab moved while I was in graduate school, and so we moved to the basement of, uh, of a building over at Scripps for chemical biology, and right next door was Gary Susiak's group with all of their, uh, all of their mass spectrometers, and we were in the Yates lab right next door. Because one of us, because we were doing proteomics and they were doing metabolomics, we didn't really have a lot of crosstalk. But I think about all the things I might have learned uh, in in uh, in that time. But uh, so the Metlin database is a major resource that's uh, really helping to fuel a lot of uh, interesting work, especially in small molecule uh, metabolomics. It is the database counterpart to the XCMS workflow that we talked about yesterday. The other database that we're going to talk about is an international effort, uh, meaning that the labs producing spectra for it uh, come from all over the place, and it's federated, which is an important structure to think about, meaning that uh, the database draws from lots of sub-databases. So we will walk our way through that. Uh, as I mentioned, we spent a, couple time, a little bit of time talking about peak picking. Um, the, that very first day, we, the, the, the exploration of Proteo Wizard was largely intended to get us accustomed to how to process from raw data sets to something that we can introduce to a system like XCMS. And then we sort of turned the problem sideways. Instead of doing peak picking on an M over Z axis, we talked about peak picking in a time axis uh, as we talked about feature recognition in XCMS. And from there, we talked about dealing with retention time alignment to allow us to better match ions that are seen in this experiment to those in another. Uh, from there, we talked about differentiation. We spent a little time with statistics, and no one fell asleep, so that was good. Um, and people seemed to, to feel that appeal to them. That's a, that's a plus. I like that. Because late in the afternoon, it's very hard to focus, I know. Today, however, we must talk about how we can identify these differences once we have them. That is a much, much less satisfactory area. And it's a shame, because I spent all of my time thinking about identification in the proteomic context. You would, you would think that there's a lot easier mapping between these two disciplines. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about what, what's been accomplished here. Uh, we, we showed a similar graph of this sort for XCMS yesterday, showing an exponential growth and a number of people making use of that service. Uh, now we're talking not about users, but about uh, what, what kind of database content we have in these spectral libraries uh, for that, that MATLAB comprises. Now, uh, I want you to think of this as sort of a pipeline. Uh, not all the pieces are shown in this pipeline, though. If we start down here in the lower left, we have what looks like a little footnote about chemicals that have been provided by Agilent and by Sigma and, and Cayman and Cambridge and Chromadex. That's great, um, but I, I don't think it really underscores how, how important these suppliers of drugs really are, because if you don't have somebody who's willing to provide you lots and lots of compounds, and you, you as a lab are trying to uh, purchase a lot of these standards to produce your own reference libraries, you just haven't got the money for it. Um, so, these, uh, this partnership that we see between the Susiak group at, at Scripps and the, the, these uh, chemical companies is hugely important. Now, um, as, we, as we move ahead, I'm, I'm probably going to make this point several different ways, but the data that were collected to comprise Metlin were allowed to be in Metlin, but those raw data we're not allowed to leave, to, to leave Scripps. So even though we have a privileged relationship between Scripps and, and Vanderbilt, um, we don't get copies of all the data in Metlin. Uh, so the, the way that they've accommodated us is that Vanderbilt and other universities out there get to make use of the Metlin interface on the web, but you don't get to just download a copy of it or even purchase it. That's not even feasible. So. 
these chemicals, the, the, chem the chemicals from these companies are shipped to Scripps. Scripps produces the spectra, they record them in Metlin, and then Metlin has a user, a user interface with which you can operate. But this is not one of those situations where you can simply download the whole database or get a license to it and then process it yourself. So the tools that they make accessible to us are the ones that we have available. As you can see, they've been hugely productive in this. Um, counting through February, they've, uh, they've got 240,000 different metabolites represented here. Now, not all, of them, not all of the metabolites within the Metlin database correspond to tandem mass spectra. Tandem mass spectra are available for only 12,000 of those. So that's a 20 to 1 ratio of metabolites they have versus metabolo metabolites that they have tandem mass spectra for. And it's quite a lot of work, actually, uh, given that a, a given metabolite is going to look different depending on what charge state you're seeing it in, what adducts that you've got it with, and what collision energy you're applying to it. Similarly, you might get a different kind of uh, spectrum if you apply uh, ion trap, collision-induced association, versus um, beam-style beam uh, CID or HCD, as we see in, in uh, thermo instruments. So producing a, a, one of these great volumes of, of mass, a tandem mass spectrometry data for, for a given compound is actually a fairly involved operation. And you've got to, of course, make sure that your metadata are intact. You don't just produce a raw file and say, okay, well, this is something. You have to keep it labeled with what compound it represents. And there are lots of ambiguities in how we do these labelings as well, as we're going to encounter. So the name Metlin comes from the idea of metabolite linking, that we have different sources of information that we want to tie together. So uh, it's, it's not enough to have just kind of the friendly name for something. You know, if you just call it... Uh, Hexos, <laughs> you know, that, that is kind of like the ultimate in just creeping names, and there are all kinds of different things that qualify as hexos. So we need to have uh, structural and physical uh, names and the synonyms by which this, this, uh, this species goes as well. So structural and physical data, part of that means being able to store the, uh, the structures uh, in such a way that we can visualize them through uh, you know, our, our ball and stick models, but also being able to, uh, uh, to render substructures from these by, by breaking apart, say, an inchy string or something like that. So we have different means by which we communicate these structures. These databases must be designed to deal with all of them, essentially. Now, Fourier transform data uh, are obviously very helpful to have. Fourier transform gives you more than just a mass value. It also tells you about the, uh, the ratio of isotopes that you see from a, from a given species. So if you've got um, you know, a funky selenium ion in there or something, a, a selenium atom in there, you're going to have a different isotopic packet than if you, than if you don't. So the FTMS data are very useful from these reference samples to give us a sense of what the empirical um, isotope uh, ratios are. Uh, we've already mentioned some of the challenges in collecting tandem mass spectrometry data uh, in that we have different energies and different ways that we apply energy to uh, ions as they break. Uh, and of course, uh, it's nice to have a bunch of LCMS data in there as well, so that we can make some predictions about what retention times these ions may be seen at as well. We think, uh, I, I as, a, uh, as a proteomicist, think of fragment ions and precursor, ion, uh, precursor mass to charge values as really the dominant information that we need for identification. And a feature that we regularly ignore in proteomics is retention time. We just don't take it into account. We might plausibly use it as an after-the-fact check to see whether this idea is real or not. But when you're dealing with the less informative fragments that we typically see from metabolites, we really need to have it to, to capture just as much of the information we have available uh, to do our identifications. So having some information about retention times, at least relatively speaking, this comes off before this when we have a certain kind of uh, column, is valuable. All right. So as I've mentioned, uh, SUSIAC's group has produced these, uh, these really strong partnerships with these chemical companies. And in many cases, those compounds have been provided free of charge to the labs so that they can uh, create this information resource. One of the things that really differentiates a system like MassBank or, uh, uh, or NIST, uh, the NIST database, uh, from what we've, done at, uh, what we've seen done at, at Scripps is that they've got a very carefully controlled uh, set of instruments that they produce these spectra from. Uh, they have both FTMS instruments and QTOF style instruments, and I think they have some triple quadruples as well uh, that they use for collecting these spectra. So if you uh, are collecting data from a particular instrument type and want to compare it to this, uh, to this, uh, lab, this library resource, 
uh, it's, it's worth knowing whether or not your type of mass spectrometer is represented in their collection. So just, uh, just for interest's sake, would you expect an instrument like an Orbitrap, which produces, uh, can produce tandem mass spectrometry in a beam type CID or HCD experiment, and then measure the fragments in an FTMS mass analyzer, would you expect that to look more like a spectrum from an LTQ or more like a QTOF? It is a it is an ion trap. It's, yeah, it's just got one mass analyzer that's a linear a stretch but linear trap. Yeah. I would say that over at QTOF. Really? Okay. So uh, when we when well exactly if, if you're doing uh, collision if you're doing collision induced dissociation uh, in a trap uh, whether it's a linear trap or not uh, you have those ions bouncing off of a set of of gas molecules until they've gained enough energy uh, that protons start migrating around on them to, to cause breakage. Um, that, uh, it, in a sense, you expect that these precursor ions keep accumulating energy gradually until they shatter, or until they break. Um, and essentially, un uh, until an ion is broken, it's going to continue accepting energy. So one of the offshoots of that is that if you do CID in a trap, you expect that none of the precursor is left because it's all gathered enough energy to shatter. Um, if you do uh, HCD, uh, you're typically doing this in a quadrupole, not a quadrupole ion trap. And that is actually very similar to the kind of fragmentation that we see in something like a triple quad or in a QTOF. Uh, because in this case, you're not sitting in a, uh, sitting in a trap to do the fragmentation. Now, in a Q-trap, the fragmentation is done in a, in a trap, even though we think of it as kind of triple quad-like. Uh, but a triple quad actually has uh, fragmentation occurring as ions pass through the collision cell. And the, uh, you're not guaranteed the, the elimination of all precursors in such a circumstance. So actually, I think, at least in principle, we would expect the fragments to uh, be more similar between a QTOF and uh, an orbit trap than we uh, in an orbit trap conducting HCD than we would uh, the HCD and CID spectrum. There are other differences though. Uh, so when we lose the low mass region of, of CID spectra, that's because they've hap because the fragmentation has been done in a trap. You don't necessarily lose those if you do the fragmentation in a quadrupole instead. Sorry, a little side side note. But in any case, I wanted to point out that. Uh, there are lots of factors that come into play in which fragments you should see. Um, certainly, if you do electron impact fragmentation, you're going to get different sets of fragments than if you're doing CFD, for example. So we have to keep that in the back of our minds. What kind of, uh, in how, how was the energy applied? Uh, um, how much energy was applied as well? What, did, what kind of measurement did we do to, produce, to evaluate the fragments that came from it? All right. As I mentioned, the library is accessible only through the website. To my knowledge, there are not web services available so that you can create software to talk to Metlin directly. Um, something like a REST interface or, or a, uh, 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 sorry, yes, Ray. SOAP? Uh, the SOAP interface? I don't think they have a SOAP, actually. But it used to. It used to. Okay, that's good. Well, then I, I need to look more closely into what's available there. Um, Generally speaking, the experience of working directly with the database through the website is the one I've got the most familiarity with, and um, it's been somewhat limited by days that the server's up and down. So um, I think that hopefully the stability problem uh, that I was dealing with a few months ago is gone now. All right. So um, it's always useful, I think, to look at example entries. Uh, and the example that is most easily accessed on the website is caffeine. Um, if you go down to uh, Susie's Coffee Shop on the third floor of, uh, of uh, Learned Lab, you'll, you'll see, or uh, of M M MRB3, you'll see that they have a nice large uh, rendering of this uh, printed up there for you. So this is caffeine. It has a uh, Metlin ID number associated with it. We've got its mass. This little MZ calculator might seem kind of pointless, right? I mean, you, you know its mass, you know it creates ions, so it should be really easy to 
compute what masses you could plausibly see from it, or m over z values you could see from it. But the calculator is actually kind of useful because it tracks things like if you have a sodium adduct, for example, what kind of mass, uh, mass to charge value does it have? So that little button is actually a little more useful in that case. Uh, these are some of the different names, uh, naming systems that we have to deal with. So everyone calls it caffeine, of course, but we have this nice synonym. I, I don't know if this is IUPAC uh, nomenclature or what, but 137 trimethyl xanthine 7 methyl theophylline theine. Plenty of names. I, I, I see someone shaking their head. Is that not? Are those, those aren't uh, synonyms for it? No. Uh, oh, okay. So I, I, I don't remember my organic chemistry well enough to sit and evaluate the, the trimethyl xanthine. Xanthine's uh, anyway, yeah. So we have all these different possible synonyms. We also have a systematic name, 137 trimethyl purine 26 dione. But we also have some very basic stuff like the formula. So eight carbons, ten hydrogens, four nitrogens, two, two oxygens. We have a CAS number, uh, is that the chemical abstract service? Or chemical abstract services maintains a metabolite uh, number, okay. And because different vendors have provided these compounds free of charge, they also get advertising. So we have the Sigma Aldrich number for it, we have the Chromadex number for it, and if you, want to, if you want to add that to your shopping cart, you can just click it right out. So that's wonderful. Uh, we also have things like keg ID. Are people familiar with keg? Good, good. So the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomics? Okay. Genes and Genomes? Okay. So I should, I should know that off the top of my head. I don't, sadly. But uh, all right. So we have a keg ID. That's very useful if you want to know in which, pipe, in, in which pathways within the species uh, is this compound known to be active. So we can take a look at that. HMDB. Anyone know that one off the top of your database? The human metabolome database. Very good. All right. So we've got this one. We've got a PubChem number. Uh, we have some information about where you can find more information in the published literature on it. Uh, how recently has it been touched? Is it a drug? They say no. Take a quick vote. Who, th who thinks caffeine's a drug? Lots of people think caffeine's a drug. Okay. We like that drug, though, right? Okay. There we go. So we've got that covered. We have a nice structure here as well. So. There's a fairly good bit of information, and hopefully it's linked to other databases out there. So having produced an identification through the database, having looked at this record, you now have ways that you can go buy it or figure out what reactions it's part of and so on. That's an important feature here. So when we do the visualizations here, we see that the database contains both positive mode and negative mode uh, spectra for this. We can look at them, uh, in this case, these are data taken from a, a QTOF. Uh, so we see that uh, the, ion, the, the fragment ions that we see uh, are related, but they are somewhat different as we, as we go between the two polarities. Uh, and helpfully, multiple energies are available here. Uh, although I, I visualized the 40 volt ones, we can, we can uh, scale that down a bit and see how, how different the fragments are that are produced from it. Uh, I guess it's worth noting here that the, uh, the mass that the ion takes on when we do this in positive ion mode is different than the mass when we go in negative mode. So uh, we've got the removal of a hydrogen, uh, the addition of a proton, et cetera. So, sorry, what? Oh, I thought I heard a comment, sorry. All right. So. There was something funny that happened back there. I'm not sure what it was. I think it was a hiccup. Oh, it was a hiccup. Oh, no worries, no worries. Oh, I drank a lot of tea at lunch, so I'm probably uh, going to be heading there myself. So, all right, here we go. We now have several ways that we can query this database. And they are a little confusing, if you ask me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to walk through these bit by bit as we go. We start with a very simple approach to doing the search. Imagine that all you know about this thing is the mass that is observed for it, the, uh, the, the, uh, the mass to charge value for it. Uh, as you can see, when you, uh, when you pick out a mass, you next need to inform the software about what tolerance could be applied to that. You might know that, that mass value, the, the mass to charge value uh, within a very small number of ppm if you've measured it in an FTMS instrument. But if you've got your measurement on a trap instead, you're obviously going to have a lot less confidence about it. So you can switch uh, whether you're dealing with this in terms of PPM or in terms of M over Z. 
the next thing is that the software needs to know what range of adducts are, uh, are plausible for this ion as well. So if you select, uh, okay, if you select uh, the neutral mode, then you're going to need a neutral mass for, the, for, the, for this chemical, which means that you've inferred the charge about it and you uh, know whether to pull off the hydrogen or whatever. Uh, if you want to go to, uh, to positive mode, we, we expect that it's either a sodium adduct or a protonated adduct, basically. Um, if you have, uh, if you've added special, uh, if you've added salts to the, the mix, then you might have something like a, a potassium ion instead. Um, in negative ion mode, we're going to get a different set of these uh, highlighted, and so that, that choosing this ionic mode here is more than simply how do we in, how do we infer the mass associated with it. It's also associated with which adducts are going to come into play. Uh, now the advanced mode is, is a little easier. If you have uh, if you have a set of compounds that you work with very frequently and want to dig up uh, as much information as you can about them, you can enter the the Metlin ID numbers to pull that information out. You can do mass ranges. You can specify particular chemical formulae if you happen to know the. Uh, uh, you, you might, for example, have an FTMS packet that you've observed for this ion, and from that you can. Uh, you know to some degree of certainty what the ratio of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and so on would be. Um, so uh, that's helpful, and it may just be that you're trying to figure out which keg pathways uh, these things apply to as well. So we've got pretty good options there. You can even specify that you're only interested in dealing with those, uh, those compounds for which MSMS data are, popu are, are provided in the database. That's not a guarantee for these. As we, as we saw, only one in 20 of the compounds in, in Metlin as a whole also have tandem mass spectrometry data. So the simple approach here is to go looking for an ion that you've seen in mass spectrometry. The advanced approach is when you have some identity that you're trying to get the information about. But we do have a couple of better options uh, to go digging into these. So here we want to, uh, to, to deal with experimental data that we've, that we've had to work with. Now, it may be that you have a whole set of masses that you want to search at the same time, and for that you can use the batch. Now, again, I'm talking about mass spectrometry, not tandem mass spectrometry. So, again, we have the options for neutral, positive, and negative. We've got the, the PPM tolerances and so on. Uh, we get lots of information uh, back. Also, I would note that metabolites aren't all one class. And, helpfully, Metlin uh, includes quite a few entries for things that are not that you might think of as peptides instead. So you can strip all of those out if you, if you don't really care about all the tripeptides that are also present in the, in the database, you can strip those out. Now the fragment search might seem like the thing you want to do when you have tandem mass spectra. But in fact, the fragment search is a little different than that. And we're gonna use that as an example as we walk through the, the demonstration sets. Uh, in this case, you're allowed to give five fragment M over Zs. So you can't just feed it a whole tandem mass spectrum. Instead, you're going to be highlighting the major M over, Zs that are, M over Z values that are found in the spectrum. Uh, now, I have a PDF that's included in your, uh, in your workshop, uh, the, the things that we copied from the thumb drive today. And it has some, uh, some values highlighted here. So this is a spectrum. And here, I've highlighted in yellow those ions that are the most intense within the spectrum. So when we do this test, we're going to be using the fragment mode for those, uh, those yellow values. But that's obviously a pretty big curtailment. We're only allowed to include five M over Z values as we go. Uh, again, we have tolerance mode. Uh, we can uh, filter out, uh, uh, we can uh, avoid matches to, to some of the ions here. One of the things that, uh, that's kind of unusual, in my view, about the fragment search is that you can give just the fragments of the thing and not the precursor. It also has that option that you can add the precursor, but if you're simply looking for substructure matches, so you want to understand more about, uh, are the fragments of this thing known? Do they, do they correspond to other structures uh, that are similar? It may be that you're, you're, the intact metabolite is not in the database, and yet the fragments from it are. So you can use this to go hunting down information for these substructures that are found within your metabolite. So we'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. Was there a question uh, forming on that, on that point? Okay.
All right. Now, when we deal with tandem mass spectrometry searching, um, most of the time what we we're actually going to make use of is the MSMS spectrum match. And in this, we get to give it 30 peaks. 30 peaks, again, is a lot smaller than the list of fragments we generally have to work with when we have a tandem mass spectrum in hand. So you've got to do a little bit of curation to strip out everything but the top 30 peaks. Uh, we still have positive and negative ion mode stuff. We can supply what collision energy we, uh, we produce this at. And we can provide uh, precursor and, and MSMS tolerance. Even if you've done a, uh, this fragmentation in, in a triple quad, you can still force it to use a fairly wide uh, you know, a scale of Dalton's tolerance for the fragments. I think that the maximum uh, precursor tolerance is limited to 100 ppm, though. All right, and a precursor m over z. So in this case, the precursor m over z is not optional. Here we have a known precursor that produced fragments of this, of this mass. And when it comes back, hopefully, you're going to have a query mesh that looks something like this. I think a lot of people call these butterfly plots. On the one hand, you have your experimental data up, and on the other hand, you have the spectra from uh, the spectrum pulled from the library shown against it. So ideally, where there's a big spike in the experimental spectrum, there should be a big spike in the uh, reference spectrum. If there's not, that's kind of a problem. Uh, right. So this is uh, the, the data that come back when you do a caffeine comparison. These butterfly plots show up at some of the other resources out there. And I'll, I'll try to show those as we move along. Now, uh, one of the ideas that's been most influential in spectral library searching is that of the dot product. And I really think it's important for people to understand this. Um, in a dot product search, we have two spectra, yes, but they're not spectra per se to the dot product. To the dot product, they are vectors in a, a space. So let us imagine that we have 100 m over z values that we've reported M uh, that we've reported intensity score in this pair of spectra. That means that we have a 100 dimensional space. Both of these vectors are starting out at zero and pointing off in some dimension there. It might be that one has a lot of, a lot of high intensities associated with it, and therefore the, the vector points even further from the origin than does something that has relatively small uh, intensities um, produced for it. But they still carve out some direction in that 100 dimensional space. If these two spectra are just like each other, the, the ratio of their intensities are the same at all of their m over z values, then they're going to overlie each other. They're going to produce a very small angle between them. If the, uh, if the angle is, uh, is and that, that's true uh, regardless of the relative intensity overall, because what we're, what we're comparing here is the angle between them, not the distance they are from the origin. If you have two ions that form a 90 degree angle in that space, well, they're not a match, all right? So the, what we want to do then is compute that angle, and that's what dot products give us. So in this case, we are able to compute the, uh, we're able to compute the, the, uh, the sum of intensity products along these m over z values. So let, I remember we said that we had 100 different m over z's at which we'd sampled intensity. So we can sort of think of a, the first spectrum as a, a row of 100 different intensity values. And then we have a second row of those intensity values that represent the second spectrum. And maybe some of those are zeros, and some of them are big numbers, and some of them are small. But uh, in each case, we're going to compute the product down that column. So we're going to multiply that first intense intensity observed at, say, 210 by the second intensity observed at 210 in the other spectrum, and we'll compute that product. And we'll do this for each of the columns between this pair of spectra. That gives us a, a set of products. Then we're going to sum all of those together. So that, in effect, is giving us the, uh, the, the cross of, of, these, these two, uh, of these two vectors. We also need to compute the magnitudes of those two uh, of the individual vectors that kind of give us a uh, kind of a sense of what the best possible score would be. So, uh, what pops out of that uh, once we've done the uh, some, some square rooting and other stuff? I haven't shown the equation up here. Uh, is a, a value that represents the cosine of the angle between the two spectra. So, when we compute the cosine of, of theta, there we're able to give a, a a discussion of how similar they are. So uh, who remembers 
what uh, the cosine of zero is. Oh, very good. Lots of people had trig. That's great. So yes, uh, a value of one means that you've got a perfect, a perfect match in the direction these two vectors are pointing in n space, where n is how many m over z values we've got. If we have a, 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 a cosine value that comes back as zero, that's really lousy. You know, that, that reflects the worst possible result, essentially. So, uh, so that's, that's the process that we're using. And this shows up in all kinds of spectral library matching. So you should always keep in mind that two spectra that have intensity at the same locations in the m over z in m over z space are going to score well, and others are going to score poorly. Does a, does that spectral contrast angle, as some people call it, uh, does that give us uh, any sense of whether the ions that produce the good alignment between the two spectra are close together or far apart? Does the, soft, does, does the computation of that angle take that into account? Oh, I see a lot of confused eyes on that one. All right, remember what I said about how we draw the, uh, the, this row of numbers for spectrum one and this row of numbers for spectrum two, and we're just computing straight down the, the products of those two values. When we just sum together all of those products, the software is not taking into account whether the high values are all bunched up in the spectrum or they're all very far apart. So imagine that you have some ion and its isotope. If you've matched the first isotope to, between a pair of spectra, you've got a good, a good product for those two. And then there's the next row, the next cell over where we have the, first, the, the second isotope of the thing that we've seen. These are not independent of each other. As a result, you may have a situation where the spectrum, the spectrum is dominated by one major ion and its isotope. And the fact that, that all the intensity in this spectrum and all the intensity in this spectrum just happens to be in those same two values is not much more information than that they've matched in one of those values. So it's a, a point about which we have to be a little careful. Um, a spectral contrast angle, a dot product of this sort, uh, really relies upon having a diversity of fragment information that we can work from. And spectra that are kind of degenerate, that have just one or two peaks in them, uh, where all the intensity is found, can mislead the algorithm. All right, so I'm not going to belabor that any further, but I would point out that this paper back in 1994 from Steve Stein and friends is a really influential one in that space. It is, uh, it, it's kind of an, an, an evaluation of all the different methods they tried for doing searching in their library and, and which one came out as the best. So and spectral, spectral contrast angles or, or co uh, dot product cosines or whatever you want to call them, these, these values were uh, a winner by a long throw. And it, when we do library search, almost every system out there makes use of something very like this. All right, that brings us to MassBank. Now, um, MassBank has a very pretty and very colorful website, and um, it's easy to find. It's just massbank.jp. It's a Japanese database. Um, and it's a, it's a system that has uh, continued to evolve under, under funding from uh, the National Bioscience uh, Data Center in Japan. So they, some, uh, a lot of people have thrown a lot of resources into this. And I, something that I think really marks it as a success is that the number of contributors to this database keeps growing. Um, they're not just all in, all in Japan. People across m several countries are now contributing spectra to it. So that is a, a very valuable uh, direction for it. Uh, they provided data up through 2012 on their website for how many different visitors have been coming there. And you can see that they kind of had this breakover point after 2010 where people really started using the service um, in, in, in larger volume. When, uh, when, people do, uh, when people make use of this, they have a lot of different requests that, that they can apply. Uh, there are some people who are just asking how to, how to make use of it, people who have data that they are thinking about sharing as part of MassBank and so on. So we see kind of just different, uh, different ideas of, of how people are doing this. This is not, uh, this is not a site that's, uh, that's just a, kind of a one-trick pony of, I have a bunch of data that I want to identify. What does this website have to say about them? You can see that uh, the Asian use of the system and the European use of it is, uh, is outstripping what's happening in the United States so far. Um, it, I, I think some of this may reflect the fact that 
resources like Mentlin are developed here, and so people think that think of them as more familiar. But uh, but certainly North Americans are making pretty good use of the system as well. All right. So MassBank is a distributed database, and distributed databases are hot for some reasons, and they're also cold for some reasons. Does everyone remember Napster? Napster? A few people use Napster. Okay. Napster is an example of a distributed uh, file system where uh, where there's no one single server that operates everything. Uh, instead, we have a, a network of servers that may be able to give you access to the file you want. In this case, MP3s. Um, it's not just systems like Napster that have used this distributed uh, this distributed storage system, though. Things like uh, why am I totally drawing a blank on it? The Proteome Commons repository, for example, was designed as a distributed database where spectra for proteomes would be distributed across the whole network of people who had uh, contributed servers to the network. And that worked out pretty well at first. Um, the system was designed to randomly, uh, to randomly distribute which, uh, which packets of data were present on which servers. And it always had redundancy in it, so that if you needed a file, that file might be found on any of three uh, servers, each of uh, some of which were more accessible because they were closer to you than others would be. So that was a, a really nice framework. Unfortunately, um, Proteome Commons went through a, a rather difficult period where a lot of people decided that they didn't want to host their servers anymore. And rather than being structured saying, okay, I'm going to shut down this server, we need to evacuate the data from it, they just turned them off. Um, and as a result, a lot of the information that was to be stored permanently in Proteome Commons was lost. Um, because, frankly, a lot of systems administrators just didn't feel like dealing with the overhead of coordinating the shutdown of these servers. So that was a really big loss to the proteomics community. And a lot of journals which had just switched to requiring people to upload their data had to back off of that requirement because the data were no longer securely kept. So that was an issue. So MassBank is distributed. It has some of the same strengths and some of the same weaknesses. It's going to have the strength that because many people are running MassBank servers, um, they, have a, they have access to a broader variety of data. But it also has the disadvantage that you may need to call upon a data set that's, uh, that's only kept on one server or no servers at this point. 28 different research groups uh, at the time I wrote this in March were running servers. Uh, that's very promising, I think. Um, some of the publications that led this came from the Institute for Advanced Biosciences in Japan. Uh, and the School of Engineering at the University of Tokyo has really done quite a lot for, um, for increasing the diversity of the spectra included there. This one site has included uh, electron impact spectra for more than 11,000 compounds. So I, I really have no idea how many technicians they had on a project at that scale, but uh, they, they made it happen. MassBank itself is not really geared to do a whole bunch of organized um, standard protocol collection of spectra. Their goal is to collate across these servers and make it so if somebody uploads a spectrum for a, a compound, if that compound is already in the database, it will add that into the existing record rather than just having them show up as additional records. Oh, uh, I, I should note that the 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 paper that introduces this mass bank is one of the files that you should have received today off of the thumb drive. Or it'll, it would have been in yesterday's collection as well. So there are uh, plenty of database services, uh, services that we can make use of for this. Uh, you may have a spectrum that you've got to, uh, that you want to compare to their library and see what you can hit. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm not kind of blanking here. The short version is that we're, we're going to be able to compare the fragments seen for your compound to those that were seen uh, in the, the spectral library available at MassBank, and from that you get a display of It's obviously quite small here, um, but one of the things I would point out is that this is another butterfly plot. So we have your experimental spectrum on, on, the, on heading up and the library spectrum heading down in the same plot. So these are really uh, very common places in this field. It also has a substructure search, though. So it may be that your fragments are, um, uh, that, that you've collected in a tandem mass spectrum or an electron impact spectrum 
their relationship to fragments of other compounds that are also in that library. So you have the ability to do substructure searching as well. Hopefully, there is a batch service for, uh, for dealing with mass bank. So if you have a pile of spectra that you want to search, that's grand. However, uh, there are limits to how many spectra that you can pass in. And instead of passing them a standard file, like an MGF or a, a DTA or an MZML, I mean, heaven help us, that would be great, um, they have their own file format. So the text file that I've included, I think it's called Mass Bank Sample, is uh, an example of what their file format looks like. So you can pass them data of that type. You give them some information about what kind of instrument uh, produced these files and what, it, what level of tandem, of, of tandem mass spectra you, you have to contribute as well. Oh, I forgot about that. This is, uh, this is a very helpful feature that the, the website for this, um, now, now if you give them a thousand spectra, you're only get back, going, to, going to get back the 20 best hits, right? So that's pretty limited. Um, now, the folks at MassBank are willing to talk to people about running other servers that would be able to have access to all of the data innately. So if, if uh, the Center for Innovative Technology decided to become a mirror of MassBank, you would probably be able to create other methods by which you queried this database uh, not just using this website, which has a pretty serious limitation, 20 hits. Um, but helpfully, those hits are cross-referenced cross to K. So we already saw that Metlin does this, MassBank does as well. Now, I haven't really spent a lot of time talking about this resource, but it's, it's one of the great granddaddies of the metabolomics field, but it really wouldn't be complete if I didn't talk about it. So, the, the NIST spectral libraries are, uh, are intensely valuable. They have um, several different products that are available now. NIST does not sell them directly, but you can purchase them through uh, several vendors who make them accessible. So these include things like a peptide spectral library. That, one is, that, that one's just free for download, actually. Um, they have electron impact libraries that are really the standard reference, I think, uh, in this area. And they produce a pretty extensive LC library as well, uh, for uh, LCESI uh, library for people who want to work with them. So um, one of the resources that I'll talk about quite a lot in the lipid identification talk uh, draws upon the NIST uh, electrospray library for small molecules instead. So um, I've mentioned butterfly plots several times over. Here we see them again. We get some chemical structure information out. We can see that there are lots of different hits that are going to result if you pass in a spectrum that it recognizes. In this case, arginine uh, just hits lots and lots of records throughout NIST. Um, I, I would say also that the, the people who run the NIST library are very, very devoted to analytical detail. So the, uh, you, you'll be able to see most any uh, ion that you care about in positive mode or in negative mode. And you'll have a variety of collision types maybe ion trap plus uh, QTOF collisions or, or um, uh, HCD collisions at least uh, to be able to work with. So um, the, the other piece is that NIST has its own search engine that's capable of dealing with you know, commercial scale files. So if you've, if you've got 10,000 spectra, something like their engine really is capable of comparing it to very large volumes of, of, uh, li of library spectra. At present, uh, they do not have the same number of compounds. Everyone remember the number from uh, Metlin on how many compounds they had with tandem mass spectra? 12,000. 12, so we see that NIST has about 7,000 in this, in this edition. Um, lots of different uh, precursor ions that relate to individual compounds as well. So I think that these probably uh, are, I think that the number we would compare uh, to Metlin in terms of number of compounds is this one rather than this. Lots of different spectra for them. Um, and I would also note that NIST, like some of these other sites, does a pretty good job of trying to produce uh, consensus spectra. So if they have multiple spectra for a compound, they use all the, all the copies of that spectrum that they've got to create a consensus for what that spectrum should look like. So they may say, for example, that no ion in a consensus spectrum can be seen in less than half of the copies of the spectrum that we have for it. We already talked about that in, in some respects with 
kind of the missingness uh, aspect of, uh, of XCMS yesterday. So in this case, they're using uh, kind of averaging over the, the many copies of a spectrum they've got to produce a more robust example of what, what fragments are most frequently seen. Uh, as you can see, most of the data they've got, though, are from positive ion mode rather than negative ion mode. Um, so that's, uh, if, if you're spending a lot of time in, in negative ion mode space, that's probably going to diminish the effectiveness of that library search for you. So uh, and we can also see that they, they've covered both trap and beam type collisions. Um, so it's, it's a really valuable resource, and I'm going to talk about how we've used it in the second set of slides. So, lots of takeaways from this. Um, obviously, lots of people have thought collecting a whole bunch of spectra for known compounds is a useful thing. And there's there have been decades of research in this area at some institutions. Uh, so, uh, electron impact spectra used to be, the, the, the used to rule the roost, really, in metabolomics. And I think that some of that uh, unquestioned superiority is getting eaten into as, as our resources get better in the LC space. And as liquid chromatography times become more reproducible. If an unknown compound appears in many contexts, it may be that that's, that tandem mass spectrum is already represented in one of these libraries. That's not to say all of them are. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time uh, trying to get ready for this workshop by looking up spectra for lipids and found that um, the, the representation I found in some of these resources was not as good as I expected it to be. So it may be that, uh, it may be that your lipid is a really great hit and yet not represented there, uh, so that, that can be a problem. Um, keep in mind that dot products are behind this. Your understanding of how dot products are computed helps you to be a better connoisseur of the scores that come back. You may understand that this type of spec, that, that, that this particular spectrum match is an artifact of having very few informative peaks rather than one that has uh, intensity spread across the spectrum. 